What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekaWatt video. In this one, I'm going to be building an awesome 4K gaming PC build inside of this, the brand new Lee & Lee O11D Vision. Could this be the best version of the O11D yet? Stay tuned to find out. I'll be walking you through all the parts that make this build possible, how to assemble it step by step, and looking at performance later, with a few nice beauty shots of this PC build along the way. Let's do this. <laughs> The Corner Master Cube 500 flat pack is a case that lets you do it yourself with support for full size specs in a compact form factor. A highly adjustable design lets you build as you unbox and it really is like nothing else. What's more, support for up to EATX motherboards, 360mm long GPUs and a 280mm AIO up top make it super versatile for the latest components. Build it your way with the Corner Master Cube 500, now available in black, white and macaron. Check it out at the first links in the description below. I'm going to split this video into two main sections. First, I'll be running through all the parts that make it possible and how to assemble the system. And then secondly, I'll be taking a look at performance, seeing what the frame rates are like, and also whether this case has got airflow compromises as a result of its awesome aesthetic. Let's look at the case, shall we, in a bit more detail though. This is the O11D Vision, the latest iteration of arguably the original popular fish tank PC case. All the panels are fully removable. And what you'll notice if I take this top panel off is that on the corner of the panel, we actually have a clip system. What this enables is fully edge-to-edge -edge glass design between the front, side, and top panels. The case has got a few cool features. The motherboard tray can be moved up or down to optimize for different layouts. In this case, we want plenty of room for a rad on the bottom of the system. Additional fan and radiator mounting support on the side. Naturally, airflow is going to be a little bit more compromised, but there's still plenty of options with room for an exhaust fan as well here, something that's really going to help when it comes to channeling all that airflow through. The only thing to note really is that this case, while coming in at a modest 139 for the black and 149 USD for the white, doesn't come with any fans. Now, most people buying this case are going to pick their own up anyway, but it's something just to bear in mind if you are considering this chassis. I'm going to move all of this glass out of the way before I drop it and smash it and then have a really bad time so that we can take a look at some of the other components that make this build possible. Now, I've paired up the MSI MAG Z790 Tomahawk Max Wi-Fi with the new i7 14700K. Now, before you come at me, when it comes to high-end multi-threaded workloads, Intel is still the better option than AMD. Chips like the 7800X 3D are fantastic and one of my favorite CPUs ever. But this i7-14700K adds more cores, has great clock speeds, and while it's a little on the warm running side, shall we say, does provide class-leading performance. I wish Intel had provided a bigger jump with 14th gen, but this is the only one of the chips with more cores, and the only one that really provides a tangible gain over the 13th gen CPUs it replaces. I'll be installing it into this, which is the Tomahawk Max, as mentioned, and I quite like what MSI have done with their Z790 refresh designs. This board comes with a few cool features. We've got Wi-Fi 7 for better connectivity, a fully toolless M.2 installation, which basically is as simple as pushing that in and pulling it out. It literally couldn't be any easier. And a few like green neon accents. These are a little bit difficult to coordinate to your build, but with the graphics card and other components in, they're gonna be largely hidden anyway. Of course, all of these Z790 refreshes are DDR5 as standard. There's no point going for DDR4 anymore, as it simply doesn't make sense, even if it saves you a couple of dollars here or there. As far as the RAM goes, I'm gonna be adding in the A-Pacer Panther DDR5. DDR5 is a bit different. Haven't used APACE's DDR5 before. Kind of differently. It's two 16 gigabyte DIMMs packaged separately, but you know, we'll give it a go. 6,000 megahertz. You are going to struggle to go too much further than that on this board anyway, as far as RAM X and P speeds go. And for gaming performance, this thing is going to be more than adequate if I can actually get into the box. As far as matching with the build theme as well, this kit is going to do us really nicely as the Supreme graphics card. Oh God, whoops, <laughs> is black and silver. So accent wise, it kind of fits perfectly. Second and fourth RAM DIMM slots for the Panther memory. There we go. 
quite low profile as well. So certainly very easy to put in, even with large Kawa air coolers. And while I'm here, I'm also going to pop in the i7 just to the left of the memory in the CPU socket. While I'm here, I can also pop in the SSD and I should tell you about it, the Samsung 990 Pro. I use this drive so often that I almost forget to mention why I've picked it. Super, super solid. Cheaper in some instances than the 980 Pro. So latest price and availability will be up the links in the description. It's just rapid. And these drives have come down so much in price. Two terabyte drive like this is simply a no brainer. I always get told off for forgetting to take off the peel on the heat pad of the M.2 drive, but it's because it's so fiddly that I just can't get it. Oh no, oh, oh no, 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 no. There we are. Yes. Yes. With this being fully toolless though, you'll see just how easy it is. Slide the drive in, push it down, pop the little plastic clip over the top. So it just slides around, there we go. Nice and easy. And then the toolless M.2 heat spreader just goes on the top. There we are. Push it down, clicks in. How easy was that? That is in. No qualms, no problems. Really like the Tomahawk range from MSI. You're not gonna get loads of overclocking headroom, but you get enough and it simply has all the features that we could possibly want. Just take a look at that. What is not to love? Maybe the green accents. Let me know in the comments down below. There's one more component that I do wanna take a look at before actually going and putting the motherboard into the case. And that is the CPU cooler. I would never recommend that you do the entire liquid cooled installation outside the case. However, taking a look at the specific CPU mounting hardware can be quite an important step as it's easier to get at the socket and everything around it now rather than later. Quite a clear instruction manual. This is the Lee Lee Galahad 2 Trinity. Very popular cooler originally, so I'm hoping this version is just as good. Intel, 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 Intel. Looking at the instructions, pretty easy. All we need to do is just add the back plate, some screws and these stoppers and that's basically all there is to it. The the actual pump itself is going to go on in a moment's time, but let's get the back plate and everything else on now and save ourselves hassle later on. I've taken off the top of the case, which actually makes you guys seeing the motherboard installation a lot easier. It kind of looks weird. I'm happy about it though. It's, it's nice. It's a cool case to build in. Just get the motherboard standoffs nicely lined up. There we are. Bit of push required to encourage it into place. Then it's a case of fastening all the standoffs. So three across the top, three along the middle and three down the bottom as always. Only sport for an ATX board in this case. You are going to struggle with an E80X design, there would be a lot of overhang there, even though it would technically screw in without too many problems. The next step is the radiator. Now, what I like about this new Galahad 2 Trinity is first that the fans come pre-installed. That's a nice touch. But perhaps more interestingly, that you actually have sort of rotatable fittings between the radiator and the pump and water block. Now, I suppose the idea behind this is it reduces sort of cable fraying here or allows you to more easily move the cables in the direction that suits your build. But also, of course, it aesthetically looks a lot nicer and makes cable management a bit easier. Or should I say tube management a little bit easier. I'm gonna pop this on the side of the case in exhaust and then use the bottom of the case for intake. Now to do that, I need to stand the case upright and screw the radiator in from the back. I think that's going to be the best sort of aesthetic way of doing things. Trying to figure out your fan orientations in a case with this kind of layout is a little bit more tricky. But secure the radiator in and then it's a simple case of popping the water block on top. No pre-applied thermal paste, so you need to do that yourself with the included tube. A large grain of rice, roughly, as a size guide is what I go for in pretty much all of my builds. Once the cooler is in, the GPU is next. Now, I've picked up the RTX 4080 for this build. In all honesty, you could also consider swapping it out for the 7900 XT. That would save you a little bit of cash and give you similar levels of performance. But if you're particularly interested in DLSS3 or better ray tracing performance, then this is undeniably the better option. It's also absolutely huge. Like it's heavy, the cool is insane. It's just a crazy graphics card by all accounts. Going back to the point I made earlier about aesthetics as well, this triple slot chunky boy is gonna match the whole theme of the build really quite nicely with the silver tied in to the cooler plate, tied into the memory. The cooler does actually include some alternative top plates so you can take off, for example, this one here and replace it with a clear ring for the RGB diffusion to be slightly different. But I think the whole build as it is matches quite nicely. I also quite like that this has got the PCI Gen 5 power connector, super compact, easy to cable manage and does look that little bit better. Now line it up with the motherboard and that's gonna show us which PCIe slots actually need removing. So it's the second, third and fourth. This is a triple slot card. I'll look at performance in a bit more detail on this in a moment after it's installed and we've got it wired up with the power supply, which is of course the next stage. And I've got this, it's Cooler Master's new MWE Gold V2 1050 watt modular. 
ATX3, fully modular, PCI Gen 5. It just ticks all the boxes, really. 1,000 watts is probably a little bit overkill for the 4080. We recently compiled an article on our website, geekwater.com, of the best PSUs to buy for an RTX 4080. And I'll link that up in the card section now and in the description below. I might add some custom PSU cable extensions later, along with some more fans, which I need to order for the bottom of the case. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and get everything wired up as is to get this build working and round things off quite nicely. And then all that's left to do is put the panels back on, check out the performance, but first how good this thing looks in the only way we know how. It's time for a Gigawatt montage. Yeah, baby. Oh, it looks so good. <laughs> The next thing to do is look at performance. Does the slightly restricted airflow of the O11 Vision hit frame rate? Is the 4080 still the card to select? Let's take a look and find out. The first game I tested out was Starfield at 4K high settings. Here the build pulled in 75 FPS on average. Now this is obviously of course more than that golden 60 FPS metric, but by no means a triple digit frame rate either. 75 though is still pretty good for Starfield, which is a fairly poorly optimized and difficult to run game, even on a card like the 4080. Move through to Hogwarts Legacy, also tested at 4K, and things improve slightly, but not drastically. 80 FPS on average, with consistent 90 and 99th percentile results. But if one thing is for sure, the game looked visually stunning. Moving through into Warzone 2 at 4K high settings with DLSS on quality, and this build pulled in 126 FPS on average. That 4K frame rate then really starting to increase and showing what this build is capable of. We also tested out Fortnite at 1080p competitive settings for a bit of fun. Everything's tuned down to low except the render distance, which was set to far, and then the build pulled in 307 FPS on average. 90 and 99th percentile results were solid too, as you'd expect from a 4080 and i7 high end combo. Apex Legends at 4K high next up, tuning things back up to that top end resolution, and the build achieved 198 FPS on average. This is a build that really does have lots of horsepower when it comes to playing the latest and greatest AAA titles at 1080p, 1440p, and of course 4K. What do you guys think of this build? Let me know in the comments section down below. If you enjoyed this one, get subscribed. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.